everyone, I'm Dr. Necka. Welcome to our new series of Community Conversations. We are centering the Black perspective on redefining Black futures. If you are new to the channel, please like and subscribe for notifications. If you've already subscribed, we genuinely appreciate you. So listen, I need your help. We have some phenomenal folks with us. So please share the videos with the Oakland community and anyone concerned about what's happening in Oakland. Now let's get into the video. Welcome everyone. After noticing a trend of higher unemployment rates among black college graduates, including some of my students, I decided to dig deeper by conducting a qualitative case study to amplify the voices of, of the black Bay area workforce. So here's like, three key findings that emerge from the study. One is Black San Francisco Bay Area workers are experiencing the negative effects of racial trauma, which is significantly impacting their overall health and wellness. The second one is job security often requires Black employees to assimilate into the dominant work, workplace culture to ensure job stability. And lastly, social networks pipelines, Dr. Khalid, and pathways can help Black San Francisco Bay Area job seekers take charge of their career tra tra trajectories. So the other thing is joblessness. What we know is joblessness and job instability affects everyone, including everyone here. Job insecurity results in a lack of disposable income for Black families, which decreases the circulation of dollars supporting Black-owned businesses and generational wealth accumulation in Black families. Bay Area workers, in particular, experience more job instability and unemployment, even with a college degree. I think we can all agree with the famous quote, which is insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. And in the words of the great coach Wilbur Jiggetts, what works works and what don't work, don't work. And it don't make sense to keep doing the same stuff that don't work. So I ask all of you here to add to the collective conversations we've been having that redefine black futures. Welcome all of you and thank you for accepting my invitation. So let's get started. We'll start with an, with introductions with. Hi everyone, thank you for welcoming me to the space. My name is Wid, my first name is Widmeyer, but I go by Wid, but I am a nurse here at UCSF in San Francisco. I'm a registered nurse. I work in the radiology department. Um, outside of that, I also am a key member of the Black Caucus at UCSF. Um, we organize uh, mixers, galas, and events to kind of bring us all together. Um, and on my um, free time, I help at a nonprofit um, organize and promoting local businesses right here in the Bay Area. It's nice to be in company. Popcorn, corn it over to Khalid. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you uh, for having me as well. I'm Khalid White. Um, I work in higher education. I've been a, a professor in African American studies and ethnic studies for about 15 years um, in the Silicon Valley. Um, in addition to that, I'm a small business owner author, filmmaker, you know, do some things on the entrepreneurial side, as well as uh, one of the co-founders of the Pipelines to Possibilities program, which connects college to career. Um, so I'm happy to be here and talk about all things kind of related to job and career, or in some cases, the lack thereof, right? Um, but very fortunate to be in the space with each of you, and thank you for having me. And I'll pop corn to Askia. All right. All right. Thanks, Khalid. Uh, and I appreciate the uh, invitation to be in this space as well. My name is Askia Muhammad. I was fortunate enough to be one of Dr. Neka's students uh, in the educational leadership program at Mills College. Uh, so grateful for that experience and uh, really come with a lot of lived experience navigating uh, non-traditional education, doing community college, right here in San Francisco. Uh, shout out Rams at City College there, uh, really tra transferred into University of San Francisco, really embedding a lot of my work and research in social justice and interpersonal communication uh, that led me to, you know, uh, really leading spaces, uh, educational climates, how do we curate inclusion? Uh, and in addition to just education uh, on my experiential side, professionally, I've been 
working in talent acquisition since about 2016, worked in some uh, major names in Silicon Valley in the tech sector, really uh, building software engineering pipelines and uh, owning a lot of diversity and inclusion programming to try to really diversify what those teams look like. Um, I did see that a lot of these initiatives were going after the low hanging fruit, you know, uh, who's already qualified, how do we plug and play them into a software engineering role, uh, really gave me the insight and visibility into that need for boosting skills and upskilling underserved communities so we can really change what that talent landscape looks like that led me to you know educational leadership and and really transitioning at this point into more workforce development and how do we upskill again communities and think about these implications impacting uh, upward trajectories and who's getting access to resource and such. So uh, really excited to be part of this discussion and uh, I'll, I'll pop point it over to Dr. Chris. I don't know if we've got an intro from you yet. Oh, all right. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be here, everyone. Uh, the connections that I have with you all is I spent about uh, five years from 2019 to 2023 in tech, working as a program and project manager, a localization manager, and a learning and development manager as well. So I am an educator and researcher by trade. I am co-founder with Dr. Necker, my wife of Summit Learning Institute. I'm also a dean of instruction at a high school in Oakland called Alternatives in Action high school. Let's get going. Okay, again, welcome all of you. So I'm going to start with Dr. Khalid. So Dr. Khalid, faculty, Black faculty in particular, make up roughly 6% of the 1.5 million faculty at degree-granting post-secondary institutions nationwide. You are a co-founder of the Pipelines to Possibility program, and you recently released a book titled Black Voices from the Ivory Tower. Mm -hmm. So what are some of the most significant challenges you've learned that Black faculty face in predominantly white academic institutions? Wow, well, um, what I've learned through research and through experience is the fact that um, there aren't stronger pipelines to help African American qualified African American candidates move into uh, faculty and professorship roles, and I, you know, I would even take it a, a step further and say that I think that also is part of the issue in the K twelve system as well. Um, I think that you know there's been a, a devaluation of the things that we bring to the table as Black faculty, as Black staff, Black teachers, Black counselors, Black administrators, so forth and so on, right? Um, and there's just also a devaluation, but on the flip side of that coin, there's no um, there's no denying the impact that Black educators bring to the educational space, right? On one hand, we are game changers. On the other hand, we are uh, kept out of the game by gatekeepers, right? So it's kind of like a double-edged sword that we're dealing with. Um, so some of the factors that, you know, that I found through research um, have been the racial trauma that you kind of alluded to earlier, Dr. Necker, the fact um, that we are expected to assimilate racially and culturally, and that's just not necessarily our, um, our, our in our DNA. Um, and if you really want to be perfectly honest, you know, uh, this might not necessarily be research, but this is my experience in higher education specifically, and I think that you can also relate this to the corporate world, it's a very corporate structure and it's very much based on a plantation model. And if you think about the plantation system, that has never been something that we were able to thrive at. And that has never been something that has been created in, with our best interest in mind. Um, you have one or two outliers who may be able to ascend from uh, the fields into the big house, so to, so to speak. But all in all, that's not necessarily a good model for us as a group. So the fact that we've been um, culturally and systemically kind of you know, kept out of the, um, the, the ranks of education by this gatekeeping corporate structure, um, it, it just really doesn't, it, it doesn't work well. And so Black Voice from the Ivory Tower, the book and the film kind of, um, allude to some of those experiences that myself and my colleagues have had 
And then on the flip side, as you mentioned, the Pipelines to Possibilities program is trying to take graduate level students from the HBCUs and develop an intentional pipeline into faculty and administrator and leadership roles in higher education because we know that the HBCUs equip our young people with uh, a mental and emotional kind of grit, for lack of a better term, also an academic preparation that you just can't get at your Cal State schools or UC schools or that type of thing. And so there's an intentional focus on the HBCUs um, by the Pipelines program. And last point, the HBCU at the graduate level, they educate all students, white, black, green, orange, international, you know, so forth and so on. So our HBCUs are incubators of talent, of, of promise, of opportunities. And I think they go overlooked because they're so far removed physically from California. Wow. I, I, wow. I, 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 Wid is going to be asking the follow up questions. So before I move on to ask Kia, Wid, did you have a question? Sure. Um, I, I guess it really is a conversation about the last thing you spoke about, about HBCU kind of being that pop pipeline. Um, once in place, once the student, uh, once the career person is in place in those situations, how do you, how do you foresee, uh, preventing isolation? And because here they are going from a predominantly, you know, um, same environment, same culture to something that is, um, unfamiliar to them. Well, that's a great question. Um, there's going to be some learning curve. There's going to be some trans some transition and some anxiety that comes along with that and some, some difference in experience going from, let's just say, Tuskegee, Alabama to Fresno, California, right? There's going to be some, just some changes, some transitions. So we, as the, the Pipelines organization, we still involve that individual in uh, continued professional and personal development. We also have a mentoring component where you know, the, the mentor kind of follows, follows along with them. So they're not necessarily in complete isolation. We also advocate for the cluster hire. Um, we're big proponents of cluster hires. So maybe you hire two, three, four faculty to come over from Tuskegee, Alabama to uh, Fresno, California or something like that. So they uh, operate more in a group setting. But yeah, there's I don't know if there's a way to um, completely eliminate that sense of possible isolation or that sense of possible um, uh, transitional anxiety moving from one side of the coast to the other. I don't know if there's a way to eliminate that, but we try to mitigate that through our mentorship and, and still hands-on professional development opportunities that we provide. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, a feedback that I got from a previous meeting um, was uh, relating to mentorship and kind of preventing isolations since you have a, a point of contact that can kind of like relate to your experience or at least provide feedback. Um, mm -hmm. Another thing was um, doing like um, frequent um, frequent um, committee uh, meetings. So like where people can come together, 50, 60 people can come together and then um, break away into clustered groups based on interest and com communities will end up just building from itself. But I appreciated that feedback. Thank you. Thank you. So as Kia, you worked in, in people ops, you worked in tech, you've done a lot of different things related to tech. Um, one of the things that I noticed is re reports show that black workers are underrepresented in the tech industry. We already know that. In fact, recent numbers show that blacks make up 8% of workers and 3% of executives in the U.S. So some of the key issues that have come up, even in my research, include systemic racism, bias in hiring and promotion, isolation, which we just heard, and the lack of mentorship, which we just heard, and limited opportunities for advancement. So my question for you is, um, since you have worked in, in, these different, um, in these different orgs for several years, what, what have been some of your observations? Did you notice racial bias in recruitment, hiring, the promotion process for Black workers in tech in the Bay Area? Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate the question and uh, also the data behind that. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if there, there is even less representation post-pandemic, right? Because it's, it's exacerbated at this point. 
Uh, but yeah, you know, uh, a lot of recruiters have the opportunity to fall on their lap to jump into the opportunity. I was fortunate enough to have an internship in recruiting for a small startup while I was still an undergrad, saw uh, really potential for my skill set to jump in and add value, but uh, really saw that need for that diversity and inclusion presence as largely teams were ho homogenous. And uh, especially on that leadership front, that's an ama a really valuable way to uh, measure uh, and gauge the diversity of an organization. What does it look like at the leadership level, uh, not just for uh, people of color, but also women. But I will say, uh, you know, coming in, I at times I worked for a few startups. I was the only uh, African American at the entire uh, nonprofit, or excuse me, uh, as the entire uh, startup. And uh, I've also worked for larger companies that, uh, you know, cleaning up after a mess. I, I won't speak on any specific names here, uh, but you know, when companies become public. Uh, their data and, you know, that homog homogenous teams and presence, uh, it becomes public as well. So uh, coming in and, hey, you know, it, it's out there. It's known that this team treats women, has treated women historically, you know, different than uh, some of those model minorities, the Asian and white males uh, filling a lot of the roles. Uh, so coming in, changing the narrative, how do we create that climate where folks can feel they can be their authentic selves, uh, build community through ERGs even, you know, uh, I was part of a self-driving startup that uh, we, we created this ERG cruisers of the African diaspora. And uh, we did get leadership buy-in and we created this space and branding. We all had t-shirts and we built community, uh, but it really takes a lot of intentionality to find your tribe and build that. Uh, and, you know, since my graduate school experience, uh, it's it's funny because I actually upskilled myself with a master's credential. Uh, and, you know, this is 2022, still implications were cascading down from uh, COVID, but I was impacted by layoffs at a major technology company. We were about 88 folks. It was reduced to eight. And I was part of that reduction. And the the folks who stuck around, I'd say, were not from the diverse side of the company. Uh, and since then, you know, I've had to work different jobs. I, I did move into a nonprofit sector now, which is amazing because I'm more at the community level where I'm really enjoying this work. But, but I did have to navigate a $50,000 pay cut that I'm still uh, navigating and picking up side gigs. And I was bartending through college and didn't think I'd have to continue to work in the service industry with a master's degree, but here we are, right? It's the climate we're in, uh, but it, it takes a lot of resilience and just not letting this climate dictate our own self-worth, you know, just knowing that, having the faith that, you know, it will align, just continue to read the right books, get the right education, be in the right communities. Uh, but yeah, in the technology sector, I largely noticed it and it's certainly exacerbated. I'd be curious to see what the data suggests pre-COVID to now. Thank you, well, Thank you for sharing that. Um, it's, you know, the one thing that stood out was um, the self-driving program um, that you were able to initiate. Um, I've always wondered, like, when you have a change maker that comes to a place and is able to pivot industry and to the direction that you hope for it to go, and it actually is implemented, what happens when you leave? Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, it's a double-edged sword because sometimes you build, you know, your baby in this project and you leave and you hope that it continues to flourish and grow. Uh, but it's about having folks who really are bought in. So uh, if I were to be the main uh, owner of a program, you're not totally sure because a lot of that's proprietary information as well. I'm not so I'm not as tapped in after I leave to know what you know was a result of the ERG. Uh, but uh, that said, you know you hopefully leave it in the right hands. You hopefully have the right amount of buy-in culturally. Uh, but that's a really good question. I don't have a certain answer to that. Uh, but, you know, you hope for the best, certainly. And especially if if uh, you have enough buy-in, hopefully it snowballs and continues to grow. Uh, but it it is a really interesting question. Yeah. Yeah. I've, um, yeah. I've, uh, yeah, I've started a few projects where 
um, being kind of like the main motivator behind it. And then, you know, everybody gets excited. And then as soon um, as I move on to the next project, it's like, oh, you check back on to see how things are going. And it um, it un ends up unfolding. So I I wonder if anybody here has a feedback or a solution to those kind of issues. Yeah, and I'll just provide one other example of uh, that ERG building experience was earlier on in my career. I was able to be part of more sophisticated projects, you could say, as I expanded my skill set. Uh, my most recent experience for a major technology company, I was actually part of identifying a real root cause of some folks dropping out of our interview process as, again, the homogenous teams, the homogenous interview panels. Um, and they may be interviewing with us and we don't have a woman or a person of color on the panel who's not a model minority. And then they're interviewing elsewhere because let's face it, if you're black and you have a computer science degree, uh, you can pick from any <laughs> startup or technology company you want, or at one point, maybe you could. Uh, uh, but that said, I, I largely realized that we need added representation to these interview panels if we want folks to take us seriously. And I built this inclusive interview panel initiative where we actually we couldn't opt uh, folks who were, you know, qualified to interview into the panel. Uh, but I reached out. I, I uh, make sure it was compliant with HR, I worked with business partners, but I surveyed our entire um, black engineering staff and Latinx and engineering staff, I said, hey, here's an issue. We don't have representation. Would you like to be part of interview panels? And we, we could pull you into this uh, pool of uh, essentially underserved or underrepresented panelists to boost representation in interviews. Uh, we rolled that out. We got about 30 panelists who signed up. And essentially, every time we could identify with good faith that someone was uh, Latinx or Black, and they're coming in to interview as an engineer, we could then pull from this group of inclusive interview panel members um, and create way more representation in panels. And that led to more hires of uh, persons of color. And I hope that's continuing to flourish. But uh, I, I don't have as much of a pulse check on that project, but I am very curious if that one's still rolling. That's great. Thank you. So I I have a, um, a I, eventually I'm going to have a question that comes up for everybody and it's going to be centered around representation, how much that mattered to you. Um, did you experience when you first started your career or even along your career tra trajectory, did you experience tr uh, representation and I heard some of it already. Um, and how much did representation matter to you, um, because we have all men, I am going to eventually ask that question, but before I do that, I want to turn to Dr. Harrison, you worked in tech at some of the top alphabet, you know, the alphabet companies, you, you worked at some of the top companies in tech. What did you notice when you were working in tech? Uh, what did I notice? So I, I noticed, one of the things I noticed is that we black and brown people were not there represented in the space. I've, I've worked with Google. I've had about six contracts with Google. I've had contracts with uh, Intuit and Facebook. And uh, I've also noticed that the majority of the workers who are in the, in the uh, cafeterias are Latino people. Okay. Uh, also, or they're cleaning up the rooms. I rarely came across, I don't think I've ever attended a meeting with a Latino person. And when I worked in, in Silicon Valley, I might see three or four Black people walking around in that, in that particular locale. And uh, even in the main campus at Google, we're just not there. We're not that we were not there. And that was from uh, 2019 to, to uh, 2023. Now, I also saw opportunities though. And there was teamwork. 
uh, there were people working on projects and and having impact, uh, but we we just were not in there in the numbers. Uh, I didn't see black men. I barely saw black women. I mostly saw uh, whites, Asians, and Indians, and that's it. It's interesting you say that because a recent report by Policy Link in partnership with Rework the Bay, which is um, an organization that I, I actually cited in my research, highlights the issue of occupational segregation. So we see a significant underrepresentation of Black workers in high paying industries like tech. In fact, Black men are the most unemployed and underemployed. So those with six figure incomes and uh, income jobs in the Bay Area are generally the only one or one of the few black faces in the room. So this produces feelings of what we heard earlier, isolation, racial battle fatigue. If you're not fighting, you're, you're on one or the other end of the spectrum. You're either fighting or you are the recipient of the, of the racial trauma. So my question it now getting to the question of, about representation, did you notice or, uh, or observe any of that when you first started your career? So I just would, at, would ask that you think about your career tra trajectory. Did you experience that? And if not, was that important for you? And this is for, all, for with Khalid, Dr. Khalid and Askia, if you can just share. Um, I, I can chime in. Um, so I think uh, being a nurse is uh, something within itself, um, being a male nurse, particularly. So there's underrepresentation there. Um, as more men are coming into the field, um, there is, um, you do see uh, male nurses at, you know, uh, at hospitals, especially um, teaching hospitals, there's a little bit more. Um, and if we're to specifically talk about the African male experience, um, I currently, when I first got to um, California, um, I worked within the first year, I worked at five different campuses at UCSF. And within my department, I was the only male nurse. Um, I mean, there was some outliers, um, you know, uh, biracial and this, but they've already, they, they were in the landscape within, I think somebody, uh, I think you brought it up in that you, um, you assimilate. A lot of them assimilated in at times, I couldn't even understand what they were saying. Um, so I think representation is a powerful thing because it allows for a lens to, so if there's a smudge in the lens, representation could be like, hey, that's a smudge in the lens. There's context to it, as opposed to be like, hey, this glasses is broken, let's throw it out. Um, so I think representation is everything. And it took moving uh, from Florida to um, California to see the, to see the wounds that um, brothers are, are causing each other because a lot of the people around, so I'm Haitian, I'm a Haitian immigrant. So me seeing other Americans treating each other in a way that is just kooky uh, is odd to me because like you guys are brothers, you're like you guys live, you're like third generations in this, you know, somebody's somebody's cousin, you just don't know about it. So it, it was very odd to me to see this um, this treatment. And it took me about, probably took me a good year and a half of being in the Bay Area to be like, oh, this is what everybody's been talking about. Because um, I didn't experience in Florida, um, there was more diversity. There was a lot more people from the islands. You know, you had Jamaican, Haitian, Trinidadians. Um, you had your Spanish people, but it wasn't just isolated to like, you know, Central America. It was from all over. So um, I, I saw a lot of representation and, and you know, I never took I've never took any obstacle to be like, oh, someone is intentionally trying to stop me until I came to uh, California, specifically Bay Area. Um, most recently, um, I've been in my position for the last three years. And my uh, job, this, my um, job status is per diem, so I pick up shifts. So um, that's convenient for me because it pays me more, and I have full flexibility in my schedule. We recently got a manager from um, from another state, and the first thing he did was to completely take me off the schedule. 
completely take me off the schedule, not even put my availabilities on the schedule. So you see everybody's name and then you see just my name just completely blanked out. So then I was like, oh, OK, well, this is a threat. And at the time, I was already, you know, pretty active in the community. So people knew who I was. Um, so I was like, OK, well, I guess I have to apply for a full time position. Because as a union worker, they can't just come in and take your hours. Um, so I applied for a full time position and I was the only one actually qualified because I'm doing the job. And they gave the job to someone that didn't meet the minimum requirement, a white male. No requirement. And I'm a union employee. So currently um, we're in the um, first um, stage of the grievance process um, and the grievance uh, conversation took about five minutes because the complaint was there was a job, you you put a minimum requirement and you hired someone without that min minimum requirement instead of the person that applied with the requirement. Um, so hopefully that'll be overturned and I'll be placed in the full-time position, but just things like that, it's like, oh, it's that blatant. And what are you going to do if you're, if I didn't have a union, if I didn't have, rep you know, I don't, I don't have representation. So right. what do you do then? I have to look for a job elsewhere, maybe go to Kaiser Oakland, maybe go to UCSF Oakland where there is, you know, 10%, 12% of us working. Um, but then, but then there's no representation at UCSF. You know, there's no rep there's no me working at the Black Caucus. Um, so yeah, representation is everything because some people would rather you not for some reason. Yeah, with what you just explained, I experienced in the tech space mm -hmm. as well. And specifically, a lot of times when I was working on teams, even the coworkers would say, Why are you not working here full time? You have more credentials and experience than we do. Now it's interesting, and I heard that on just about every team I worked on. And now, interestingly, you will see that there are articles published out there and conversations among people who are in tech who are part of hiring, and they say, well, uh, we just can't find qualified Black people or brown people. Or even if they graduate with a degree in computer science, they they still don't know the languages that we use here. And so, and and that stuff is not true. That stuff is not, I'm telling you, it's not true. Um, and sometimes they use that, that ex, as an excuse for not hiring black and brown people. Uh, and, and even when you're working, as I worked as a contractor, it's really tough because they bring contractors in who have more credentials and experience than the workers. I'm pausing. But then they put the word out on the street that we're not qualified. I'm pausing. And then when it comes down to them hitting their bottom line, when they're in the black, as they say, then they terminate our contracts early without notice. And then they expect us to come back when they treat us this way. So my question, <laughs> my question is, uh, what, what is the varied impact of job change on black workers industry teams and the user customer base in tech or even in post-secondary school settings. What is the varied impact? Because we never really talk about the impact. Yeah, and I, I'd love to chime in if, if I could back test <laughs> the representation slightly, uh, Dr. Chris. Uh, but representation matters, and even to Wid's point, you know, it's decision making, and it's deciding who we uh, move away from, and it's deciding who we include. That's right. And I, I will say, you know, I, in, in my most recent, uh, somewhat of a, a leadership recruiting position in tech, 
Uh, I was winning peer nominated cultural awards for diversity and inclusion work I was doing. Uh, I was changing the talent landscape of what our engineering teams, the makeup of what they look like. Uh, and then when the, the layoffs occurred, uh, I, I was let go and the folks they held on to, maybe they were getting paid a little less that that made stakeholders happy. Uh, but I also felt, you know, some of my trainings, I trained the whole managerial staff on uh, really diversity and that importance within, you know, just our whole recruiting function, why it matters to have that representation. Um, and I would even film some of these trainings or get them recorded. They let me go, you know, I'm thinking they just held, they got my intellectual property and that's what they wanted. Um, and even contractual or contract yep. workers coming in with all these skills, they're getting that intellectual property and they get what they wanted. So we got to protect that. Uh, and then when it comes to who we're hiring, you know, and uh, post layoffs, it was actually uh, good timing for me because I recently did get that master's degree. I had a nice severance. I was like, all right, let's go. Let's get into higher ed. Uh, you know, I was uh, applying for a charter school that was K through 12 that's repre represented internationally, uh, some local public and private uh, four year institutions in the Bay Area that I really made it, you know, interviewing for months, made it, making it to the very end. Uh, and then I, I had an offer call that was canceled and I find out from the inside uh, that they actually went with uh, the hiring manager, you know, the gatekeeper in this uh, circumstance was a white male and had a, a colleague or a buddy who was also white male who completely bypassed interviews who they gave the position to when I was qualified. Uh, I had other times where they moved they moved away from my candidacy, uh, but I certainly was qualified. Uh, and then I almost feel that I was just there to for maybe to diversify, you know, the candidate pool. Uh, I was That's also it. thinking that, or you know, I make it to the very end. And the whole panel is absolutely enamored with my ability and what I could bring to the university, uh, interview locally, and then, oh, we have this final uh, stakeholder for you to meet with remotely in some conservative part of the country who made up a decision just by seeing my name before they met with me and had the authority to pull the plug on my candidacy when the whole team I'd actually be working with boots on the ground. Uh, would have been an amazing partnership. So um, it's really disheartening and difficult. But I just, I just wanted to add in that representation and uh, how it, it really yeah. translates to decision making and how it's impacting folks. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's interesting you say that. And then I want to jump. I want to go to Dr. Khalid because I could see you nodding your head. <laughs> um, I there's a report, a recent report that just came out that shows that at least 20% of Black applicants change their names just because they're noticing we are noticing the trend that people with black names are not even getting an interview so they're changing their names so that they can at least get an interview but you are describing what happens even when you get to the interview phase so dr khalid representation how much of that mattered for you how did it matter did it matter at all yeah well, you know, in the beginning, um, it, I'll be perfectly honest with you. I don't think it mattered as much to me as it matters now. And the reason I say that is because I, I went into it knowing that I probably would be the only black male educator. And I was for a number of, of years, you know, a, a one of the few on my particular campus. Um, but over time, and again, this is my 16th year at that school um, teaching, over time is worn on me more and more and more and more being the only one, the only one, the only one, and the expectations of being one of the few, one of the few, one of the few. And then, you know, um, in the the field that I have, which is African American studies, the field that I teach, you know, I, I'm expected to do all kind of all things black, run a, this black program, teach these black courses, so forth and so on, represent for the entire black world on my campus, right? So it just becomes more and more wearing and taxing that racial battle fatigue. And when I speak up or when I say this or point this out, the gaslighting that comes with that or the, oh, you're just, you're always pulling the race card or the dismissal, all that type of stuff starts to wear on me more and more and more. So when I read these reports and these statistics about, about how, you know, in, in education now, I think it's something down to 2% of the 
two percent of the black uh, two percent of the educators in the the nation are are black male, and why black men are leaving the profession or why black people in general are leaving the profession with this um, great resignation and again this idea of racial battle fatigue in higher ed or in the corporate space in the tech world like it's very real and so representation has become more and more relevant and more and more necessary, more and more impactful because there's less and less of it. And then to uh, Askia's point, probably post pandemic, it probably has gone even, you know, even smaller, right? In terms of our numbers. So, you know, um, if we're talking about hiring panels, if we're talking about um, uh, these, you know, final interviews and things of that sort, People of color, familiar faces, black faces are definitely important. And even more so than that, or even in addition to that, I would just say the, the voice, the black voices, these are the experiences of black people who have been hired or who are thinking this way or who have decision-making power are just as important. Not just the, um, the, the, the face matters, but the experience and the voice behind the face also um, matters in terms of creating the climate that you want to, to be a place that you want to work at. Um, Silicon Valley, you know, the tech world is completely an anti-Black space. There, I don't think there's any two ways about it, you know? I don't work in tech, but the, the tech effect has worn off onto public education, higher education, all manners of, of sectors that tech has influenced. And so, you know, um, the anti-blackness is very real. It's worldwide. It probably would. It probably is in Florida. You may not have experienced in the same ways you experienced in California, but it, you know, it's a it's a national epidemic. It's a global epidemic that we face. Um, and then, too, not to be labeled a point, but we even um, have the crab of the bucket mentality and 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 learn that behavior and enact that behavior among each other, right? So. If there are two of us applying for the same job and one gets it, or if, if one's in decision-making power, they may say, I want to be the only one. I've had that experience, and they kind of, you know, uh, prevent me from interviewing or moving on. Or So you have it. You kind of get it from both ways. It's learned behavior, and um, it's, it's learned behavior globally, unfortunately. But, um, you know, what can we do other than know that it's very real? protect ourselves as best we can and, and um, create groups like this that can support us in our decision-making, in our, in our thinking, in our um, trajectories um, as we talk about, you know, work, education, so forth and so on. And, and one more small follow-up. Uh, I, I really like what you said, uh, what kind of representation are we receiving? And especially when you think early career, uh, you know, can you see someone who looks like you in a position you want to grow into and you're very impressionable post, say, you know, if you went to college or not, but just your early career? And are those, especially if there are black leaders at a tech or non-tech company, are they showing up authentically? And if not, um, that can really have uh, harmful effects to the young black professional. Um, and I do have this one yeah. I'd love to read if possible. It's from Up From Slavery, Booker T. Washington. It just kind of came to mind when I was thinking of this uh, discussion today. Uh, but, and it's, you know, a little outdated, but still I feel relevant. So, uh, quote, no white American ever thinks that any other race is wholly civilized until he wears the white man's clothes, eats the white man's food, speaks the white man's language, and professes the white man's religion. And you can really see that. Um, showing up, you know, that hegemonic uh, power and dominance when, when you're in these professional spaces. And if, you know, the Black leaders are sipping the tea or the Kool-Aid and they're not showing up authentically, it's super harmful for young professionals. All right. So we have Chris is unmuted and Wid is unmuted. Uh, Dr. Harrison, <laughs> Do which I, I don't know. You you two to, can decide who wants, and we're gonna we're gonna after the two of you, we'll take a break and okay. we'll come back and finish up. Go ahead, Wit. Um, just to answer your um, my input on your your question, what effects um, 
would happen if um, black workers are pushed out of the system. Um, it would probably be the extension of black identified um, individuals from both the um, worker side and over time as price increases the customer side. And I say that because it's obvious what's going on. And, but there's a solution to that. And I saw the solution in, in an indiv individual who opened up a cafe that is now at all service, everything, but he really geared it towards political activism. And two days ago, he um, set up a GoFundMe. Well, before, before two days ago, um, during the um, during the election a few years ago, he was able to galvanize a hundred people to do something, and they were successful. So now they have notoriety. Um, two days ago, he set up a uh, GoFundMe to raise two hundred thousand dollars. I think he's at a quarter million so far, and in the GoFundMe you would see donation for seventy five thousand. He like every hundred donations. So. Knowing, like we all know what's going to happen, it's going to be the extension. There's no, you know, if you identify as black, if you don't identify as black, if you're, you know, if you're okay doing all these other things to kind of, um, you know, fit into the cultural um, majority, um, then nothing's going to happen to you. You will continue, you'll teach your children and they'll, they'll know how to act. And, but if you identify as black, black, but African-American black identifier, um, then there will be an extension. So I, the biggest question is not what will happen because we know what will happen is like, what are we gonna do about it? And, I, and I'll just leave it at that for the break. Okay, so I'm going to ask a very big question and I'm uh, I trying to figure out if I should wait. <laughs> <laughs> Before the break, Dr. Necker, do you think I should wait? Ask the question, give, and th that'll give, give them a chance to responder. think about it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Because I, okay, because I want them to respond. So here's, so Summit Learning Institute, the co uh, company we co founded, Dr. Necker and I, it's a learning and development organization. Uh, we are a, a uh, online uh, platform. We provide MOOC courses, massive open online courses, audio books, eBooks, and other resources through our learning platform for 21st century workers. Now MOOC course platforms like Coursera, we're, we're a competitor to organizations like Coursera, LinkedIn Learning, Udemy, edX, and others. And they provide the new credentials for workers in the workplace. K-12 schools are lagging in knowing what MOOC courses are, and they're lagging and help students obtain these new credentials as high school students. So when, when these students arrive in the tech space after seeking a job, they're likely to be the only person in there of their race in meetings, eating spaces, and just simply walking around campus. For high school and college students who are interested in moving into tech spaces or post-secondary spaces, what should they know before choosing a career in these industries? And what can we do to help them prepare for being an employee in this space? And can I just add to that, just <laughs> any any underrepresented industry, because there are some going into finance, into business, mm -hmm. into medicine, like WID. So I just like to add that to it. Yep. So now we're going to take a brief break. We'll come back and finish our conversation. Mm -hmm. 